This is C-SPAN's Afterwards podcast. This week, Tangled Up in Blue, Policing the American City by Rosa Brooks, a Georgetown University law professor. She's interviewed by Art Acevedo, the chief of police in Houston, Texas. The two talk about Ms. Brooks' experience in policing after becoming an armed reserve police officer in Washington, D.C. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I'm Art Acevedo, the police chief here in Houston, Texas. And today I'm really honored and happy to visit with Rosa Brooks, uh, the author of an interesting book about policing and uh, her experience in policing, Tangled Up in Blue, Policing the American City. Uh, Rosa, thanks for being on and thanks for having me. And uh, uh, it's uh, I look forward to this conversation, but I got to start off with just one pressing question. What in the world made you leave the confines of the classroom, your home? and go on and get trained to be a police officer and hit the streets in Washington, D.C.? You know, if you ask my family that, they would say insanity, some kind of midlife crisis. Um, But I, you know, I was just curious. Uh, That was probably the driving force. Um, When I found out that D.C. has a reserve officer program where you're not just directing traffic or something, but where you can become a sworn armed police officer, I thought, I thought, no way, you know, that's crazy. You're gonna give a gun to a law professor? (laughs) <laughs> Bad idea. Um, so it, it was partly that. It was just just plain curiosity. And, and you know, the other thing, and as you know very, very well, policing has been in the spotlight for some years now. And uh, if you want to change something, I think you need to understand it. And doing this seemed like a really rare opportunity to get more insight into the world of policing. Yeah, so I said, you remind me kind of when you say that, uh, 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 my... Uh, my uh, lawyer that handles uh, 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 employee matters and, uh, you know, she came from Shell Oil. And I said, when I interviewed her, I go, why do you want to come in? She says, I want my 5-0 moment. So this was your 5-0 moment, right? And that was many years ago, and she's still here as our deputy director over legal counseling. But in your book, you know, you recount your, your, your experiences from the inside uh, as a frontline police officer going out into some of the tough neighborhoods and, uh, and seeing firsthand uh, I think the reality of policing outside of the 24 hour news cycle, which is a, you know, uh, you know, 30 yeah. second to three minute bite or Hollywood that we know uh, is not the most uh, accurate, but you said uh, you recount your experiences and, and then you say uh, and propose that in a nation divided on many fronts, we need a truly transformative, transformative response to policing. Now, how do you define the change that is needed And what does that look like to you based on your uh, several years of experience? Wow, that's that's a big question. Um, And, and, you know, let me back up, I guess, by by saying when I was working on this book and I would tell people that I was working on a book about these experiences and everybody would say, well, you know, what's what's your argument? What's your one that's, you know, that's so interesting. What's the one sentence version of your argument? And I would kind of go, "Uh, it's complicated. And people would say things like, that is the worst elevator pitch I ever heard. Um, And and they were right. That is the world's worst elevator pitch. But I think I was right too. It is complicated. And and in some ways, the, the goal of the book is to make things more complicated for people thinking about policing from the outside, not to make it simpler. I mean, you, you've seen this over and over. There's this kind of whiplash where either police are self-sacrificing, underappreciated heroes, or they're brutal racist thugs. And it can be really hard to inject into that conversation more nuance that says, you know what, there's good there, there's bad there, they're mixed up together. And if we actually want to transform policing, we need to, we need to be grappling with that, uh, all of that. Um, so in terms of what would make it better, I think part of it, Part of it, as you know, police can't change the laws by themselves. You know, police can't change the social context. And I think often police get the blame for enforcing laws that they didn't create in a, in a social context. They can't do much to change. And in a way, I think that's, you know, when, when we blame police for that, it's a way for the rest of us not to look in the mirror and say, oh, you know, cops are arresting people for really trivial offenses and we think that harms the community. Well, we voted for the lawmakers who wrote the laws that led cops to do that. You know, and when you look at long prison sentences, mass incarceration, a lot of that is prosecutors, judges, lawmakers. 
Um, so that's that's number one, you know, I think is that there are some things that cops can't change, but that we as a society urgently need to change the massive overcriminalization that we've seen in the last couple of decades, the excessive sentences, uh, the and and, and the, the cuts in other social services that might make some of what police do things that they don't have to do anymore. You know, that said, I do think that there are a lot of things police departments need to be doing. And as you know, again, one of the difficulties with policing, we don't have a national police force. We have almost 18,000 different law enforcement agencies. They don't always talk to each other. I think they ought to talk to each other. So it's very hard, you know, even if there's some approach that's really innovative and promising, it's tough to get everybody to pay attention. Uh, so the cities that have been ahead of the game, you know, and the departments have been ahead of the game, have really focused on changing training, changing how and who they recruit, changing the kind of incentive structures that officers have on their shifts, and happy to talk more about any of that. And actually, we'd really like to hear more about what's going on in Houston. I've, I've had the pleasure through a program that Georgetown co-sponsored uh, with the New Orleans police and the DC Metropolitan Police on police academies to meet some of your staff who are working on curricular reform at your academy. But, uh, and that's been, those discussions have been a lot of fun. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think that uh, one of the things that, that you say, and you mentioned it here in your book, is that policing isn't as uh, perfect as uh, uh, our, our, our greatest fans would say, and it's not uh, broken uh, like, some would think. And, and what's interesting to me is that both factions of those mindsets are very deeply held beliefs. And I don't think there's malice involved in either set. What, do you, what would you attribute that, uh, you know, how, how can we be diametrically so different in our perception, maybe critic versus supporter? Uh, yeah. Because, you know, I think I always say people don't, people fail to see things through the prism of others, right? You know, yeah. you have a very unique perspective because uh, you are you are a law pro a professor. You 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 know you're I would call you a constitutional expert on the Constitution and the law and what we're supposed to be doing and what the intent of uh, our founders were uh, versus uh, the theory and the case law and the realities that mm -hmm. uh, we experience on the street. So, from your perspective, what what could you say if you were talking to uh, those who would say we need to not defund the police, we need to abolish the police. Yeah. yeah. What would you say to them from your perspective? And what would you say to those that would say, you know, on the policing side, you know, black lives matter. Oh, they're just a bunch of whines. What are they whining about? You know, <laughs> cops aren't going around whacking people. You know, how do you, because, you know, mm -hmm. we find ourselves in policing in the middle yeah. of both yeah. of them. And as yeah. executives are trying to hold uh, the department to a standard and to a mindset and to a level of professionalism expected by the public yeah. serve, how would you address those two uh, from your, I think, evidence-informed yeah. perspective from having walked our shoes? Well, one thing I've, I've learned, not so much from this experience, but just, I guess, by, by getting older, is that you never change. Nobody's mind was ever changed by being told that they're stupid or evil. Uh, you know, it's just not not a very effective way to persuade them to do something that's different. And, and I think that we live in a political culture that lends itself to you know, sound bites and slogans and stereotypes and does not really lend itself very well to more nuanced discussion. So, and that's not just about policing, that's about almost every issue in you know, this very divided moment. Um, and it's hard to get people to listen. Um, I think that what I, what, what, I, what I do tell abolish the police proponents um, and, and many many of the, my students uh, start with that position um, is look, violent crime is real. You know, it's not something that the far right made up in order to have an excuse to lock up poor people of color. You know, there is racism in the system, absolutely. Um, and we need to address that. But, you know, be careful what you wish for. When you talk to people who live in poor communities of color, most often, and, and, and you, those communities are not homogeneous themselves, right? You can get people with widely varying perspectives, but many people will say, look, it's not that we don't want cops in our neighborhoods. We just want cops who protect us. We want cops who we can trust. We, want, we, we don't want no policing, we want better policing. We want different policing, better policing, more respectful policing, and we want different, better laws some of the time. 
And and I think I think that that argument some not not always obviously, but but it often does resonate with people. And and when I hear the sort of defund the police, I think. So cops get super defensive when they hear that, right? And and the seventh district in Washington D.C., where I was assigned, is, you know, has the poorest, most decrepit, crumbling police station in the city too. And you know, if you say to a seventy cop, we should defund the police, they look at you and they say, "Have you seen our station? Have you seen the vehicle I drive? Have you seen my equipment? We we don't have enough resources to do what we're doing now. If you take the money away, then what? You know, okay." And, and and that that's the polite version of their response, right? The the defensive, angry version right. is is well, you know. The, you that, know that's the public like. version, not the locker room or the cooler talk. Right. We'll, right. we'll we'll let we'll let the viewers imagine the other version. Um, um. But if you say to cops instead something very different, if you say, okay, what are the things that you do that frustrate you, that you wish you didn't have to do, that you don't think you should be doing? You know, what are the things where when you take a mentally ill person to the emergency psychiatric clinic and you're really frustrated because you know that that person will be back out on the streets without medications, without a home to go to the very next day. And they go, oh, you know, there are a million things that I wish this city provided. Um, and it's stunning that we have, you know, we, we end up picking up the slack because we don't have those programs. Then I think it gets you to a much different, much healthier conversation where you're saying, hey, let's work together, critics of policing and police themselves, to talk about what this community's priorities are, how we would get to them in an ideal world, how far are we away from them now, how do we, how do we gradually re recalibrate investments so that we end up in the place where we all want to be. And that's where I think you actually find a tremendous amount of common ground between police officers themselves and critics of policing. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think that, uh, that you're spot on, right, in terms of uh, there's a way to talk about issues. And, and, and what people forget is that words matter. It's kind of like when uh, uh, President Trump talked about uh, roughing them up, uh, you know, don't, don't be so kind and gentle. Yeah. You know, uh, some of the police officers are clapping and stuff. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, yeah. you know, that didn't help us. But words matter. And it matters in terms of, all, you know, uh, uh, elected officials talk about these issues. It matters in terms of how activists talk about these issues. I mean, when you talk about, you know, for example, abolish ICE, you know, that scares the heck out of, uh, people because ICE, when it is focused on bad actors, not necessarily day laborers, has a function, has a legitimate function. Well, we should go over uh, after people that are a danger to society. And so, uh, you know, how we approach the conversation that I think is really interesting. One of the things that I've been frustrated about, and I don't know how much you saw this, but, you know, you talk about the warrior mentality versus the garden mentality. And, um, I've been telling folks that when you really look at instances of unjustified uses of force, especially deadly uses of force, I would argue uh, with 37 years of experience that we got to be very careful what we ask for because what we need is people that have the mind of a guardian. That's the way I approach problem solving. But there are times, and I'm sure you witnesses, I want you to talk about it, that you better have the heart of a warrior, because I would argue that some of these deadly encounters we've had over the years is because we had people that were cops carrying a badge and a gun. They were afraid of their own shadows. And I can give you examples. So I say that we uh, like right now in Austin, Texas, where I came from, they're talking about we need to make the police academy uh, warmer, gentler. It needs to be a college environment. It shouldn't be this paramilitary stuff. And here's the thing I would caution. If we can't test your metal in terms of how you're going to react to physical adversity or uh, psychological adversity in terms of people that are trying to get under your skin, I would hate to not be able to weed somebody out that goes straight for the gun. Like David Joseph Jr. was a 17-year-old African-American young man in Austin, totally naked in broad daylight. And my officer at the time encounters him, take, comes out with his gun in his hand. Wouldn't we want to assess that kind of mindset and that kind of fear in a training environment? Did you have any experience in terms of that warrior cop versus that guardian cop and how do we balance it? How should we balance that? Yeah, no, I mean, that's, it's a really hard issue. And, but I don't think it's either or, um, you know, Sue Rohr, uh, whose work I'm sure, you know, she's, oh, she's, she's a dear the, friend. 
Yeah, I said the retired sheriff in King County, Washington, who now runs Washington State's Law Enforcement Academy. Uh, she, her, the program there, for instance, she's the person who wrote a very influential article for our listeners 10 or so years ago called Guardians versus Warriors, talking about these two different tropes. And one of the things that Sue always says that, that I, I thought was very powerful and important point, uh, in their law enforcement academy, they really beefed up training on de-escalation, verbal skills, you know, how you just talk to people so that you're not shouting at them and just giving orders to people. Because, you know, just as nobody ever changed their mind when you told them they were stupid and a, and a jerk, you know, people are a lot less likely to do what you say when you when you sound like you're a jerk, as opposed to being polite, being courteous. Um, so they really beefed up the training on de-escalation skills. They really beefed up the training on tactic, tactics to slow things down, you know, tactics so you give yourself time, space, uh, distance. You can use cover and concealment so that you don't end up creating dangers yourself. At the same time, though, they really beefed up the, the defensive tactics and physical skills training. Um, and her argument, which which I think is absolutely right, is that a lot of the really tragic lethal police shootings that you get where, where it turns out the person didn't pose a threat or they were unarmed or they maybe they were armed but they were no threat, they were running away or whatever, a cup panics. You know, people pull out their weapons sometimes when they panic. And if they don't have confidence that they can handle a situation without a gun, they're more likely to pull out their gun. So, so her, her, her area of emphasis is to say, hey, you know what? You've got to be better at those physical skills so that you will have the confidence to get into a situation and not immediately reach for the gun. Know that you can handle it if somebody shoves you or pushes you or punches you. But at the same time, you also need to get better at all those so-called soft skills. To, you know, How do you calm people down? How do you treat them in a way that will reduce the likelihood that somebody gets aggressive and violent? Well, that's a, let me ask you uh, this. if. Having gone through this experience uh, and this adventure and this 5-0 moment, what was your perception of policing from the outside looking in? And after your several years of uh, experience in a, in a challenging environment, how did that perception change and how much of the perception yeah. ended up not being reality? So I don't know that my perception changed. I think it got much more granular. Um, I I grew on the one hand, I grew up in a family of activists, left wing activists, and my mother said the police are the enemy. Uh, you know, but at the same time, I grew up in a kind of a blue collar blue collar town where a lot of my friends had cops in their families and. You know, so I did know cops as just people, you know, as somebody's dad, somebody's brother. Um, and, you know, all the work I've done all over the world, um, including in places where you, you know, horrific civil conflicts and atrocities, terrible things. There, terrible things happen. There aren't that many terrible people. You know, even the worst things are usually done by ordinary people who, who have come to believe that they have to do what they're doing. And I, I'm, you know, there are sadists, there are bullies, there are psychopaths, but most people aren't. And, and so I think going in, you know, I, I, I thought, I, you know, I, I'm immediately suspicious when I hear people say anything that seems too dehumanizing. And it's dehumanizing when police refer to the residents of the communities they work in as animals. And I've heard that in DC from some officers. It's also dehumanizing when protesters, you know, call police the pigs, right? A, and a cab, right? A cab. Right. Yeah. Um, or I, you know, I smell bacon or what I mean, there are all sorts of worse things again that we can't say on, on this program. Um th that you, you've got human, it's human beings. Um, and every everywhere I've gone in my whole life, you find you've got human beings, you got some better ones, you've got some worse ones. So in that sense, I don't, I don't think. It's, I don't think it changed my perception, but what it did do is it gave me much more sense of the ways, I mean, here this here's what I think is the real tragedy, is that sort of what I said earlier, that a lot of what is wrong with policing can't be changed by police because it's outside of policing, it's the, it's the laws, it's the criminal justice system, it's the socioeconomic divisions that are the legacy of racism, of centuries of racism, 
but and cops can't change that. And what that means is that even if you're a, a good, decent police officer and you went into policing for the most idealistic reasons, you may still find yourself making arrests that are lawful but awful, as we say, right? Uh, arrests that are lawful, but that when you sort of look at the big picture and try to do the cost benefit analysis, you say, wow, is this making the community better off? Oh, maybe not. Maybe it's actually making things worse. So, so even good, decent cops can end up making some of those structural, economic, and racial disparities even worse. And that's a tragedy, but it's also not something that cops can fix by themselves. The rest of us have to fix that. Well, I think that uh, it is a system. And unfortunately, the most visible part of that system is the frontline police officers. I mean, we are either on cell phones, body-worn cameras, or CCTV, but our our actions and our activities are more than likely going to be captured in today's world. Unfortunately, a lot of the disproportionality and systemic uh, uh, racism, I would say, because if you just look at uh, sentencing over the years yeah. uh, in terms of a uh, crack versus uh, powdered cocaine and how yeah. people have been treated yeah. differently and, and, and which drug of choice was for which community. Uh, do you think that a lot of the anger sometimes uh, that is that people tend to um, send towards police officers mm -hmm may be a manifestation more so of other aspects, prosecutors. I mean, I would even say, let's look at uh, uh, defense, the defense bar. Who do they, who gets a better defense, right? Who gets the most vigorous defense? Uh, you know, I think this is the portionality all the way around. Do you think that a lot of the maybe anger and mistrust uh, is uh, placed at the, the most visible part of the system uh, where it maybe lies somewhere else, should, should be sent somewhere else? Yeah. So to be clear, I think police departments, many of them have a lot of work to do mm -hmm. uh, internally. And I think the DC police department, which, which, which is a good police department, um, you know, but still not perfect, still has a lot of work to do. Um, so I don't want to let police departments off the hook. Mm -hmm. um, but that being said, I think you're absolutely right. And this is something that uh, you know, my colleague, Christy Lopez, uh, who, who worked at the Justice Department for many years, investigating some of the, the most abusive police departments in the country, like in Ferguson, Missouri. One of the points that she always makes when we, we teach together is a course we teach called uh, Innovative Policing. And one of the points she makes to our law students is, you guys, you're going to be the legislators, you're going to be the prosecutors, you're going to be the defense attorneys. And even if you're none of those things, you're going to be the citizens who vote for all those people, you know, and who vote for the people who make the laws and, you know, don't go saying, oh, the problem is the cops. You've, you've got to be, you've got to be part of that change. You know, if, when you, when you are all grown up, you know, and you're a prosecutor or you're a judge or you're on the city council, uh, you can't just point your fingers at the police because they're going to enforce the laws that you make. They're, you know, they're going to prosecute the people you bring to them. They're going to sentence the people who you bring to them. So no, no question about it. I, I think it's always easier, right, to have a target. And police are an obvious, you know, they're the visible face of the state's coercive powers. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's simpler, it's easier to direct the anger at them. Nobody, you know, people don't see the behind the scenes folks. Um, so as I said, I don't want to, I don't want to let cops off the hook. There, there is quite a lot that cops could do differently. But no question, uh, the rest of us need to take a long, hard look in the mirror. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I mean, we've been arguing in my role as the president of the Major State Chiefs Association. We testified about police reform in uh, both houses of the uh, Congress and the Senate and the House. I had the honor of uh, testifying. And, uh, and one of the things that I talked about is we need transparency. I mean, you know, think about the federal government, you know, uh, they talk about everybody else pointing the fingers, hey, local cop, you need to be transparent, you need to be wearing body worn cameras, you need to put out your racial profiling data. You need to... But then you look at the federal government, yeah. where are their cops wearing body worn cameras? Where are their reports? I mean, when's the yeah. last time yeah. a federal agency actually charged one of their officers with a crime in terms of the use of deadly force or found the use of deadly force? You know, uh, it, I, I always say it last about points of reference, right? You can't, you can't truly assess what's in front of you if you've got nothing to compare it to. So this is my third police department. I started with the California Highway Patrol, 
21 years left there as a chief with the Austin, uh, spent almost a decade there as a chief and now here in Houston. So I've got community points to reference and department points of reference. And, uh, you know, you can't, you can't really truly assess something unless you have something to compare it to. Uh, and so the question I would have to you is, you know, where's the transparency in terms of uh, the rest of the criminal justice system? What does it need to be? And should we be demanding more transparency in terms of what's happening with our courts or prosecutors and our, and our defense attorneys? Uh, seeing that that's part of your area of uh, life work is, is the law. Yeah, I, I'm, I guess I don't know if I would say the problem is lack of transparency as opposed to just plain lack of political will. Right. So in D.C., when you when you go through the criminal code, uh, D.C. is kind of a weird city because we, we have federal law that that is enforced by D.C. police and we have D.C. municipal code. Um, but you go through that and there are lots of offenses on the books that are so ridiculous and trivial that they shouldn't be criminal offenses at all, in my point of view. Um, but nobody goes through it. Nobody nobody sort of says, hey, let's take a look at this and see if this still makes sense. You know, nobody, that kind of cost benefit analysis I was talking about where you say, okay, you know, we could arrest, you know, 500 people for disorderly conduct and now they've all got arrest records and maybe some of them end up serving small amounts of prison time or get a big fine and let's go look at their families and let's go look at any complainants or victims and let's see if anybody's left better off by this or if everybody ends up being worse off as a result of this. They don't tend to have those conversations and those, I think, are the kinds of conversations we need to have. You know, similarly, stop and frisk, right? In, in New York City, a court declared their program unconstitutional because what they were doing, it ended up that it turns out, and this is this is definitely an area where transparency actually enabled accountability. It turned out when you actually looked at the numbers really carefully that the police in New York City were stopping a disproportionate number of African-Americans relative to their size in the population. But the African-Americans they stopped were less likely to have weapons than the white people they stopped, which ends up being unconstitutional, but which is also frankly means that cops overestimate threat from African-Americans and underestimate threat from whites. And both of those are problems, right? And both of those have to do with implicit bias. And, and you know, I can't help but mention in this regard, you know, the events of January 6th at the U.S. Capitol, I think really showcased both the best and the worst of policing at the same time. You know, that partly the juxtaposition of the heavily military militarized police response to the summer's racial justice protests in, com in comparison with the seemingly very light response to the largely white mob of Trump supporters um, on the bad side, you obviously also saw a lot of officers behaving really heroically on, on the positive side. But that kind of implicit bias is really dangerous, right? Because it both means that you overestimate some threats. So you treat, you treat almost entirely peaceful racial justice protesters like they're about to you know, storm the Capitol. And in fact, they're not. And you end up tear gassing them and so on. And you've got a lot of angry and upset and hurt people. Um, so you over overestimate that threat. And then you oh, you underestimate the real threat, yeah. right? So it turns out that the real threat was from people wearing, you know, thin blue line shirts. Uh, and we underestimate that if we're biased in favor of thinking, oh, a bunch of white people with pro police slogans on their shirts, they can't be out to do any harm. But that was the real threat. Yeah, and I thought that that was a, uh, you know, my, my uh, I was so proud of the police officers that just put everything on the line trying to protect and defend the seat of government, you know, the, the people's house. Uh, and I, I believe it was a failure of leadership, but I think that as we continue to, uh, and we've actually called for a, a, a robust uh, inquiry into inquisition into what occurred, because I think that we're gonna find out that law enforcement leadership failed, and we may find out that some political leadership failed. You know, I always yeah. say that yeah. we should let, let the experts do the assessment and then hold them accountable when they didn't get it right. But I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of uh, mistakes made beyond just the, the executives, but it was absolutely a failure. Um, yeah. I, I, that the footprint we saw on the seventh around the Capitol is a footprint based on the open source uh, data that we had, the threats, mm -hmm. the intelligence, uh, just a very open uh, call for uh, action 
uh, should have been in existence on the 5th of January, not on the 7th. And I, I look forward to looking at those, uh, at those uh, 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 re results. And I hope that uh, the police chiefs will be part of it and not just uh, who the federal government and the politicians decide uh, to use because we want people to actually want to get to the truth and not necessarily to the outcome that they decide to get to at the beginning of the conversation and the review. Let me ask you this, because we, all, we talk a lot about implicit bias. We all have them. And I think that the difference between those that, uh, that are successful and just are those that catch themselves and realize, oh, shoot, I'm acting this way because, you know, I've got a fear or, you know, as you went out there in the, you know, dark of night, uh, you know, to that call, did, did you ever find yourself on a call where you found yourself saying and recognizing, oh, shoot, I'm letting my own implicit bias mm -hmm. Uh, have an impact on my mindset or my level of fear. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, it doesn't mean you're a racist. It means you're human, right? We all have them. Did you, did you ever have that, that, that moment that maybe informed you on, you know, it could even be uh, yeah. you know, towards, you know, some, some, something you didn't even expect. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's a good question. It's, it's a really hard question. And, and, and I, I think you're right. I mean, sometimes I talk to cops who get really, defensive when you talk about implicit biases. I'm not racist, you know? Um, and I think, you know, saying to them, look, this isn't about, this isn't about you and your decisions. You know, the implicit biases that we all have, you know, we get them so early in our lives. We don't control them. They come from the media. They come from the people around us. You can't just wish them away, but what you can do is try to be conscious of them and try to make sure that you you don't give in to them. Um, but, and, and that, you know, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility to try to fix it, to try to counter, counterbalance those, those biases that we all have. Um, no, I, you know, when I think about it, I can't think of like specific instances off the top of my head, but I do think that there were moments when, for instance, I'd go into, you know, a terrible neighborhood in terms of crime rates and so on. And I'd end up talking to somebody, you know, who was, really, really thoughtful, really, really smart, educated. And I would find myself feeling a little surprised um, yeah. and feeling like, oh, that, you know, and, and that's implicit bias, right? Assuming assuming something that intellectually I know is wrong, you wow. know, assuming that, oh, because that this is a poor neighborhood, you know, that everybody I meet is going to be poorly educated. And that's just not true, you know? And so I, I think, I, I, I do think I caught myself in some moments of making assumptions that probably came out of my own bias and, and being embarrassed when I realized, uh, you know, how erroneous those assumptions were. Yeah, I, I, I think we've all been there. Uh, and it's OK to admit that we've been there. You know, I, I think the fact that you're uh, in tune with yourself and your own internal subconscious and uh, biases and, and fears uh, is is important to being successful. There was something that that you talked about, uh, about in terms of domestic violence situations. That I, I've got my notes here, and you said that uh, you made some uh, domestic violence situations and how mandatory arrest laws may have gone too far and defined the family too broadly and left officers with no discretion. Now, let me give you an example of something I did here, and then I want to get your thoughts on what you what uh, got you there. So when I got here in Houston, we have to, we have to uh, contact the DA's office, the intake office, or our officers in the field to uh, have them accept charges before we arrest people. So we have to give them our facts. And, and now the DA doesn't want us to record that. that. Sounds which, like a good idea. <laughs> yes, but the DA doesn't want us to record that. So yeah. I, 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 I don't like that because... I, I think that transparency should be all the way around. And they argue that's work product and all sort of stuff. We're still in the middle of that debate, so I won't get into it right now. But what I found is I, I go on patrol still as a police chief. I go and get my black and white, log on my MDT by myself, don't have anybody with me, go handle calls, make arrests. I turn them over. I don't take Do you, you wear the four stars when you're doing that? or do I, you? I, I do because they're sewn on. I'll also take them off. <laughs> uh, but... Uh, but I remember early on in my career here in Houston, four years ago, I go to a, a domestic violence scene and I, I wanted just to, I didn't want to intervene. So make a long story short, I thought there should have been an arrest made. Nobody was seriously injured, but there was an injury. And my officer goes, makes the call, comes back and says, oh yeah, the DA declined charges. 
So what I did is I, I, that was a learning moment for me. I didn't want to, again, nobody was killed. We could follow up later to get charges. I just want to see how my system worked. So I came to the opinion based on the size of this city and the number of calls we we're going to that I just had a sneaking suspicion. Two things were happening. One, some officers were under reporting facts uh, because they don't want to believe the victim or they're lazy or whatever. Or two, we had some DAs that wanted to prove the case beyond the reasonable doubt on the side of the road instead of clearly looking at probable cause. Uh, and so what I did, I started making sergeants roll to scenes where the DA wasn't taking charges. What do you think happened to our, ch- and call the DA him or herself, assess the scene. What do you think happened to charges? They went up. So I think a little bit of both was going on because in my opinion, if we're going to air, we air on at least detaining that person for the night. We know that nobody's going to get killed. And sometimes when there's an arrest, it's the first step, not, not that they need to be prosecuted and convicted and going to jail, but it's a leverage to get a family on the right path. That's my mindset. So having heard all that, I want to get your reaction and I want you to expound on what your thoughts were in terms of domestic violence calls. Yeah, it's another hard problem. So in DC, as you said, we have a mandatory arrest rule for domestic violence. If there is probable cause to believe that an assault was committed, you have to make an arrest and you're supposed to try to identify the primary objector, uh, excuse me, the primary aggressor. If you can't do that, uh, you you can arrest both parties if you think they're both aggressive aggressors. Um, and the reasoning behind that mandatory arrest rule was that the bad old days of policing, you'd get a male cop, you'd get a, a, a husband or a boyfriend who was beating and abusing his wife or girlfriend, and you'd get a cop who, who sort of said, A, work it out and walked away and wouldn't take it seriously. And that obviously was a, a real problem, a huge problem. So the rule was intended to say, you can't do that. You can't just walk away and say, work it out. Um, it's your private business. The problem over the years, uh, DC steadily expanded what was defined as a domestic relationship. uh, So that at this point, you know, adult siblings who share the same household or even former housemates or former roommates from several years ago are defined as having a domestic relationship. Uh, And you don't have that same power imbalance that, that you have in kind of classic spousal abuse situations. So, you know, there was one, one arrest I talk about briefly in the book two adult sisters, they got into a scuffle because everybody was stressed and they were arguing about who had left damp clothes in the washing machine. And neither of them had a criminal record. You know, the woman we ended up having to arrest as the primary aggressor was a nurse and then she missed her hospital shift. She had to get somebody to take care of her son. And you think that's just stupid. That's just stupid. You know, so so that's a law, I think, on the books in D.C. that needs to be seriously reexamined as one that may have come to do more harm than good. But but I think your broader point um, really highlights something we talked about earlier, which is that arresting people doesn't solve every problem. It solves some problems. It does solve some problems, you know, and there are situations where just getting somebody out of a volatile situation, just removing them, even if they're not prosecuted, may benefit everybody. They cool off. Everybody cools off. They got some time to think, well, maybe that wasn't such a hot idea. Um, You know, and there are people who are violent criminals, you know, who I'm I'm fine with having them arrested and I'm fine with having them go to jail. You know, there are people who are predators, uh, you know, and cause tremendous suffering in their communities. Um, But but I do think that a lot of the kinds of calls that, that we get in D.C., I'm sure you get in Houston, are people with problems that can't be solved by cops. You know, they're people with with problems, you know, they're 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 poor, they're addicted to sub, they've got some substance they're addicted to, they're having a family dispute that they can't figure out how to resolve, you know, their teenagers not listening to them, whatever it may be, and they don't feel like they have anywhere else to turn. You know, part of the reason cops get blamed is because they're the visible face of the state. That's also the reason they get called a lot, because people think, well, who can help me? The government can maybe the government can help, and the only who is the government? Well, the government is the cops, and you call the cops. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, it's 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 just a tremendously difficult problem. Yeah, I, I, there's another issue you raised in there. Uh, it's a really interesting set of questions about do we train officers well enough in what it means to establish probable cause and to write a good report and so on. Um, there's also an issue there just. 
here's an area where I wish we had more data. In, in DC, about 30% of arrests made by DC Metropolitan Police end up being what we call here no papered, which means that the prosecutor just says, ah, I'm not going anywhere with this, let the person go. And end of story, they've got an arrest on their record, that's it. It's not that they go to court and it gets dismissed or they plead, it's just, we're not doing anything. We don't know whether that 30% consists of cases where <clears throat> the problem was that the officer didn't establish probable cause in what they wrote up, or whether that's mostly cases where the prosecutor thought that is the dumbest, most trivial arrest I've ever seen. And I don't wanna waste any a penny more public money uh, prosecuting this person for something so trivial, that's stupid. Because depending on which it is, right? If it's the first, you wanna train police officers better. If it's the second, maybe we need to have a conversation between police prosecutors and the community about what the priorities should be so that when officers, officers accept in those domestic violence cases do have discretion. Should I make an arrest? Should I not make an arrest? Should I give a warning? Should I try to direct them to services? You know, and have that conversation about if the prosecutors are thinking, why are you bringing us these cases that are so trivial that it's not worth public time and money to go forward? It, cops should know that, right? Because that may affect what they do when they encounter that kind of situation the next time. You know, it's it's interesting that you would say that about uh, about uh, when when the DA kicks uh, kicks charges. Like I said earlier, here we actually get approval uh, and get them to take charges. But what's happened? Uh, we've got judges now that uh, we, I kind of call them activist judges that, that they don't want anybody to be prosecuted. It's a handful of these judges. So our no probable cause rulings are going through the roof. So what we do here is if there's a DA reject, uh, we actually have come to the agreement that they'll tell us why once they get the report. And if there's a probable, no probable cause ruling, we're actually pulling those reports and having supervisors and lieutenant, sergeants and lieutenants uh, looking at them and making sure it's not a problem of the actual case and the facts in the case or a problem of the report writing. And I think mm -hmm. that's a really good point you bring up. Let me ask you this about your experience. Uh, how has the, the way that you talk about policing and these issues to your students changed? Has it changed at all in terms mm -hmm. of what you used to say and talk about and what you say and talk about as a result of your experience as a poli frontline police officer? I can't answer that question because I didn't teach about policing until I started doing this. Ah. I, in theory, my area of expertise is international law and national security law. So that's what I taught until I started doing this. And, and at a certain point I thought, boy, um, I'm doing this reserve officer stuff. I ought to learn more about criminal procedure, for instance. And the best way to learn is to teach something. It sort of forces you to learn it. Um, so I, I started teaching while having this experience. So but, but I do think, I mean, I think the point I made earlier, the, the one that Christy Lopez always drives home is, is one that I really emphasize to students. When you think about this situation, ask yourself two questions. When you think about the situation where, where it looks like a really awful thing happened as a result of policing, you know, ask yourself two questions. One is, is this something that cops could change by themselves or is this something that the rest of us have to change, e.g. the law, for instance? Um, and the other question is, when you think about what decision you think a judge should have made, um, ask yourself what, what you know about the incentives that officers face and whether this rule will make a difference. You know, for instance, just to give an example, um, if police officers don't know or care whether somebody subsequently gets convicted, then a rule, the exclusionary rule, where, where, where a court will throw out evidence that was obtained illegally in violation of the Fourth Amendment, doesn't have any great impact on their behavior, right? Because if you're a cop and you're thinking, it's not my job to put people away forever, it's just my job to arrest them, then you don't really care if it doesn't really go anywhere. On the other hand, you know, if you think, well, no, I, my, my job performance is evaluated in part based on whether the arrests I make go anywhere, then you're gonna think about it really differently. And, and just to push them to recognize that you, you have to have a more granular understanding of how policing works, which unfortunately in our country is often very localized uh, in order to figure out what the relationship is going to be between how judges interpret the law and their decisions and how officers on the ground actually behave. 
I agree. And let me, uh, you know, you, you touched on this earlier. I, I like to say that we have the most inefficient, ineffective policing model in the free world, right? In the civilized, industrialized world. We have 18,000 police departments with 8,000 police officers, uh, you know, with 18,000 sets of policies and procedures and training and regimens and levels of accountability. I can just go on down the line. And I've always been a proponent for consolidation of, uh, mm -hmm. of police agencies. I, I just believe that the taxpayer would get much more for their bang. I think that uh, we'd be much better. Accountability would be better. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, everything's political in this country. Everybody wants local, uh, you know, they want local control, right? And so we have departments in Texas that go from one officer where the chief is the department. I mean, I'm not making this up. Uh, to departments like the Houston Police Department, where we have about 5,300 police officers, 6,300 combined. What impact do you think consolidation of uh, policing services, uh, what impact uh, could it have? And it is something that we should be talking about in this country. Yeah. You know, look at what happened in Ferguson, right? This little department that was really a taxing arm for the local a, a municipality that used uh, traffic enforcement as a tax, as a, a fundraising mechanism. Uh, and by the way, it's not just that department. I've driven to that area of the country, and it seemed like every mile there's a new municipality. And it goes on for about a mile and a half. Then you're in another jurisdiction, and so. And every um, mile there's a police car waiting to give you a ticket. And and, and and the speed and the speed uh, the speed uh, signs the maximum speed limits change. Uh, we've all seen this across the country. As you're in, what should we do? And, and from do yeah. you think that that would make an have an impact? Yeah, it's a great question. I haven't thought about it in terms of consolidation before, um, but that, you know, that's a really interesting way to approach the problem. I, I do think it's a huge problem. And I, I've often thought that for, you know, the things that we read about in, in the papers or see on TV usually involve big city police departments, not always, but, but typically. And there's a reason for that, which is that journalists live in big cities and, and you know, the people in big cities know how to get information to journalists. And so big city departments are under a constant spotlight. That's not a bad thing, right? Because I think knowing that we're going to face public scrutiny, that's appropriate. You know, if the state gives cops weapons and badges and the power to take away people's liberty and their lives, it's totally appropriate to expect that you're going to face a lot of scrutiny. But I think what that has meant is that there has been a lot more pressure on city departments to, you know, be accountable and to clean up their acts when they're screwing up and to, to you know, because they know they're under that scrutiny. I often worry much more about all those tiny little apartments that nobody ever thinks about, you know, where, where we have no idea what's going on because they're too small. You know, they're, they're below the radar screen for, for most of the, the national media. Um, and I have a feeling that that's where you actually find a lot of really bad stuff. And, and I don't mean to paint everybody with the same brush. I'm sure there are absolutely fabulous small town and county police departments and sheriff's departments all over the country as well. Um, but that lack of scrutiny, that lack of transparency, I think, is, is kind of scary. And I, I don't, you know, I guess the other way that you could try to get at that problem, and this is something that Congress, if it was so inclined, could do, you know, Congress can't control directly state and municipal law enforcement, uh, but what it sure can do if it if it wants to is use the power of the purse and create some pretty strong incentives. You know, and police departments, like all the rest of us, go where the money is. And if you have Congress saying, "Hey, there are massive grants if you do this and that and the other thing," if you know, if you conform to these standards, if you agree to these these processes, if you have a training curriculum that looks like this, you get a lot of money. A lot of departments are going to go, "Oh, okay, uh, I kind of want that money. That would be great. I'll do that. It's not a big deal." You know, that that's a really powerful tool that we haven't used enough, and certainly under President Trump, uh, that was not his administration's priority at all. Well, uh, he tried to use it to force uh, agencies to enforce his uh, in immigration policy. That's right. That's true. Uh, and the courts, you know, we've got to be careful because if we do it for one, administrations come and go. So it's kind of like executive orders. Everybody, when they like the president, they love executive orders. And when they don't like the president, they hate executive orders. And Congress needs to do their job, right? So we got to be, I think we've got to be real careful uh, with that. Uh, but let me, let, me, let me ask you this, because I think, you know, you've got a very unique perspective uh, coming from a family that, you know, where 
progressives, maybe didn't like cops that much, you know, to, uh, you know, maybe being a progressive uh, legal scholar that's teaching young, uh, young uh, uh, aspiring uh, uh, attorneys. But I like to say that one of the challenges we have is that we live in the world of the 24 hour news cycle. You know, I get beat up and hate mail for a critical incident, bad policing incident that happened four years ago somewhere else. And four years later, I'm getting email hate mail like it just happened today. And it was my jurisdiction when both of those uh, weren't facts. And here's the challenge as I see it. Uh, here in Houston, we, we handle about 50,000 mental health people in mental health crisis a year or more. And last year we had one that went very poorly. It went sideways. We ended up killing somebody that was in mental crisis, Nicholas Chavez Jr. And, and my, and my, and my assessment, I ended up firing a sergeant and three officers, those three officers, you mentioned time and distance in terms of training on day one, I would ask your viewers to go look at, find my presentations to the Academy cadets on day one, where I talk about, I'm going to hold them accountable for utilizing time, distance, numbers, backup, covering concealment. Uh, when they use deadly force or any other force, they're going to be held accountable for utilizing those uh, tactical considerations. But so we, we end up firing a sergeant and three officers. Obviously, the union wasn't happy, but that's not what I'm here for, to keep them happy. But the sad truth is that that one incident made people forget yeah. the fact that we are a learning site for the rest of the country. That we've that 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 the, we had that one go wrong, but we had tens of thousands go right. In your experience that you write about in the book, how, what percentage do you think in terms of? Now let's talk about malfeasance. What we control, right? We can control our own hearts, and be good cops or bad cops. What percentage do you think uh, is bad policing, and what percentage do you think is actually? cops doing the right yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, the so-called bad apples. Yeah, apple I, you know, I saw very few bad apples. Um, and I saw very few moments when I thought somebody was doing anything worse than being a little bit more of a jerk than they had to be in some pretty minor ways. I saw some comments that disturbed me that cops made in private away from members of the public. Um, but but I my experience was mostly working with good people who were doing their best to help people and solve their problems. And and, and that is something actually that I do emphasize to my students is that, as you said at the beginning, from Hollywood and TV shows and news stories, you know, people get this sense that, you know, being a cop consists of, you know, you go from shooting scene to high speed chase to, you know, beating up a suspect to another high speed chase and, you know, a homicide investigation. And the reality is, is, is both much more mundane and a lot more positive. You know, the reality is that you're getting calls because somebody's neighbor's party is too noisy and you're getting calls because somebody says their bike got stolen and, you know, or, you're getting that kind of stuff over and over and over. You're getting a call because there's a burglar alarm went off uh, in a store. Somebody shoplifted, some, you know, petty thievery. Um, and you do get the shootings. You know, you do get the homicides. You do get the violent crimes. But the bulk of any given shift for any given officer is dealing with these little things and dealing with people who are upset, you know, and I'm so upset. I can't sleep. My neighbor's having a loud party. And it does, you know, it makes a difference that you can be the one to go next door and say, hey, guys, could you turn the music down? You know, the kids next door, they can't sleep. And usually people actually say, oh, yeah, sorry about that. You know, that, that I also very rarely did I encounter hostility, you know, on the contrary, even even in a neighborhood where you might expect more hostility to the police, most people were cooperative, polite, and would say things like, you know, thanks, officer, partly because they know that you're usually there because somebody called you, you know, somebody wanted you to come. Um, and, and that I think people do miss. And that, that does not excuse, you know, any of the abuses or bad behavior, or even, even the petty rudeness. That does not, you know, to say, oh, yeah. I'm but, complaining you know, about cops is the rude, number one. Yeah, right, right. And, and you know, so, so the fact that you've got a lot of decent people who really are helping people doesn't for one single second excuse any of the bad things, but it is important for people to understand. You know, I think I think of this as parallel, you know, my, my field before this was thinking about the role of the US military, national security, and the Marine Corps has a concept called the strategic corporal. 
And the idea behind that was, look, remember that guy who peed on the Quran and there are, you know, protests erupt all around the Islamic world because the because an American soldier was caught on video peeing on a Quran. Was that guy representative of U.S. forces? No, he was a low ranking soldier. It was his own stupid, obnoxious act. And it led to chaos for U.S. forces globally. And the the concept of the strategic corporal was essentially saying there's no such thing as a purely tactical decision anymore. You know, that even the lowest ranking person, if they do something particularly bad, the whole world is going to know about it, you know, 10 minutes later, because somebody's going to have it on their cell phone. And we need to train to that. You know, we need to train people to that. We can't just say to the low ranking soldiers, just do what you're told. You know, we need to have them understand here's what the mission is. Here are the kinds of challenges you're going to face. That we need them to be critical thinkers. We need them to be people of good judgment. We need them to have a nuanced understanding of exactly what it is that we're trying to do here because we just have to expect, and it's totally fair, that people are going to put us under a microscope. You give, a, you give people that much power, they have to expect that level of scrutiny. So, I, you know, I, th I think it, it's hard. It is hard, you know, and it does create stress for officers, that feeling of even if I just make an honest mistake, like failing to turn on my body worn camera and you know, people do it all the time. They, you know, they forget, um, you know, they're not trying to hide something. They just plain forget. Um, and cops go, oh, my God, you know, if I make a mistake like that, people are going to think I'm this monster who turned off my camera so I could hide my abusive behavior. And, oh, I can't handle the, the, the pressure. And it is hard. But I also think, you know, we just, cops just have to kind of deal with it because that's the world we live in. It's the world we live in. And, and the book is Tangled Up in Blue, Police in the American City with Rosa Brooks. Thanks for writing the book. I hope people will read it. And thanks for taking the challenge of learning about policing from the inside out instead of the outside in that sometimes is skewed. Thanks for, thanks for the conversation. Thank you so much, Art. Take care. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards podcast. Subscribe, rate, and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Send us an email at podcasts at c-span.org.